Uh, a couple of uh, items in terms of procedure that will follow. Uh, I will introduce the speakers. They have each been asked to take approximately five minutes to provide their perspective on the topic. We'll then ask for a bit of a round table discussion amongst our four presenters. And then we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. So we'll make sure as they're speaking that you make a point of jotting down the questions that you think are really stump them, right? So we want to make sure we have good tough questions for our speakers as, uh, as they're proceeding. So I'm going to begin by introducing Tony Winston, and then I'll introduce our other three speakers. Uh, Phil is just out in the hall right now to see if he can track down Monica, because she's not here at the moment. So we may just have four speakers in terms, as, as opposed to the advertised five speakers. So. Uh, welcome again. So our topic is Sustainable Cities and Who Are We Kidding is the uh, byline. And our post first speaker is Tony Winston, who's in the uh, Department of Sociology and Anthropology. And I have a lengthy introduction for you here, Tony, but uh, <laughs> I'm see, I see the blossom page. Of course, it's the last one. So uh, some of you will know Tony. Any, any students of Tony's here? This is from uh, the second Hellenic. One poor soul. <laughs> but uh, Tony comes to us with a lot of experience in terms of uh, political economic context of diet and nutrition, sociology of food environments, sustaining rural communities and local ecologies, rural community restructuring, political economy of the Canadian agri, Canadian agri food complex, as well as agrarian social structure and its relationship to politics and the state. So Tony brings lots of experience. Uh, he's worked in a variety of contexts around the world. Uh, in fact, there's a reference here to a book. Uh, looking at coffee and democracy in modern Costa Rica. I got that correct. And uh, I've got lots of other things to say here, but that's probably enough to know. We've got a pretty learned person here with us this afternoon. Keep going. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your comments. So thank you. Okay, well, thanks for showing up. Uh, I'm going to have to go through this very quickly. There's something about a five minute time here. We don't usually work in that time frame, so, <laughs> okay? Uh, anyway, I'm not sure if that's focused. Okay, so this is my title, Sustainable Cities. My take on it is food environments, like it or leave it. And I'm saying it can't be sustainable without transforming them. Okay, so around issues of sustainability, we're going to have to confront, uh, um, are we going to confront a human nature? or be the, the dominant socioeconomic and political system that humans have constructed. Well, by nature, we could say humans have demonstrated that they're, they're infinitely creative, but they're also infinitely destructive. I'm sure we get no argument on that. And if, I, if you do give me an argument, that wouldn't go out. <laughs> um, that, uh, Richard White warms us in his short history of progress, an excellent book, you really gotta read that if you have A bad smell of extinction follows Homo sapiens so true. He's a positive guy. Um, <laughs> well, you can't do anything about human nature. We can only compensate for it. That's my words of wisdom on that one. We can do something, I want to underline that, about the social organization of society, and we must. Well, food environments, they help us determine the carbon footprint of the, of the, of the city. Um, they uh, determine the livability of the city, the quality and diversity of work in the city, uh, and the health of human inhabitants of the city, about which I am particularly concerned here today. Food environments necessarily reflect, however, the prevailing political environment. <coughs> in capitalist society, the social relations peculiar to that system um, throughout most of the world have meant following, ultimate subordination of all values around food to profit making. The externalization of, of the environmental and human health costs of the current food system. So, what are the consequences? Current food production practices contribute heavily to the destruction of nature. Probably no surprise to most of you. Valuing of the low cost production so it values low cost production, durability of food, that is shelf life, um, and cosmetic appearances above all else. And in the process, uh, it degrades diets and human health. And I'm in the process of writing a book. I'm trying to finish that book, which to make that case a little stronger. I will focus on the nutritional dimension of food environments in the remaining time. I'm sure that's about five minutes. Um, the current reality 
I would argue, and, and this is a concept that I've developed to understand food environments, is a spatial colonization. I'm going to pitch this here because I assume that some of you have taken geography courses, you consider yourself geography or whatever, um, of food environments with nutrient poor edible products high in fat, sugar, and salt. And it's pushed by transnational food processors, uh, processors, fast food chains, and global supermarket chains all around the world now. Spatial colonization helps us understand the geography of contemporary food environments. It's, a, I think, a useful concept for that. It is the end result of uh, different rates of profits for different commodities, which I call, which has been called differential profits. And, corporate concentration, market power, and mass advertising. So that's what is uh, you know, producing spatial colonization. And what is it? It's how food corporations uh, uh, secure the physical visibility and the availability of the most profitable edible commodities. I didn't say food, I said edible commodities. <laughs> and these are typically, and I've done research on this in the past, so I can go on and on. So that's, uh, uh, these are typically nutrient poor ones in various food environments. They, and, and it happens in two basic ways. First of all, securing prime urban space, and that's where the fast food chains come in. And also securing prime supermarket space. That's a key to the uh, food environment in our society. And here I have just a shot, just a few illustrative things. Let's go to the PowerPoint, because that didn't happen. Uh, McDonald's, right in the old colonial center of Guadalajara, Mexico. They're everywhere. And you go to the supermarket, you see endless displays, special displays, and throughout the shelves of, of these types of products. You can't see them in black and white very well, but basically, they're products high in sugar, fat, and salt. Um, I love these, the most uh, visible, uh, the new innovation in the modern supermarket, the ice cream case. Now, there's a healthy treat for you. <laughs> but they put a lot of money and effort into ice cream products. They're hugely popular. So, I probably don't have a huge amount of time left. I think it's about that. Oh, okay. It's about time. more relaxed. Did I introduce myself? Okay. Can we transform our city food environments within the prevailing political economy? Um, interesting question. I don't think there's any, you know, simple answers to that. We could say look to the example of Toronto which I have I've been looking at in the book for my book, uh, amongst other places. Toronto's a very interesting place as far as food goes. If you know anything about it, you'll, you'll have some idea. But there's some really neat things happening. Of course, there's been a resurgence of farmer's markets in the last uh, very few years, actually. They're popping up all over. There's been exclusively organic markets popping up and so on. That's a very exciting thing. Um, there's organizations like Food Share, which is working in hundreds of foods across the, uh, the GTA, uh, basically Toronto, uh, are trying to bring healthy food, fruit and vegetables, principally, to school kids that weren't getting them before and may not be getting them at home. So they've done some really important things, this organization, Food Share, that is deals with their organization. Um, and they're transforming school food. There's a number of other uh, interesting organizations, the Stop is instance, that are trying to transform Toronto's food environment in some way, shape, or form. So it's kind of neat. Um, but I think we need to consider what must be done to take these advances to the next level, because they're, they're rather limited, and they don't necessarily happen in too many other places in Canada. Um, we need to move it to that level where non-elite food environments promote real nutrition, real diversity, and minimal environmental impact, rather than maximizing uh, returns to investors, which is what the principal logic of uh, the food system is today. And it subordinates all other, uh, I would say, goals and objectives, ultimately, much too often. We need to ask, paraphrasing Einstein, can the significant problems with urban food environments be solved within the political economic framework that created I'm not giving you a yes or a no. I think we can leave that up to the data, have any views, of course. But there you go. 